Whoa, for the longest time, I've wanted to do this episode. However, I'm worried since technically the first letter for this band is a T, but since that rule won't matter in a couple of future episodes for this season, I'll try to stop worrying about it. Anyway, The Offspring. They formed in Gone Grove, California in 1984, meaning they've been around for 35 years now, with only 9 albums to their name, and maybe a possible 10th on the horizon. With a consistent lineup of brilliant punk rock edge and an ability to match sarcastic humor with bitingly realistic success, so the offspring might be aging, but damn, can they be fun to listen to. Now, it's my job to tell you how fun they can be. Now, let's face the music. We start with the offspring's debut album, The Offspring, released in 1989 as their only release through Nemesis Records. It was produced by Tom Wilson as the band's shortest album, the 31 minutes and 23 seconds. First, it's the background. The band first came about when drummer Dexter Holland and bassist Greg K. Kreisel played together in the garage. Uh, they were at a party later listening to the album Change Today by a band named TSOL, and after a right broke out following a show by Soul Sword Distortion, Greg and Dexter formed a band called Manic Subtidal. Holland moved from drumming to guitar, and they brought in Doug Thomas as the new singer, and Jim Benton as the new drummer. A second guitarist named Mark Spurge was there for a bit too, but they never recorded anything with him. Thompson was pushed out, and Dexter soon took over on both guitar and vocal duties, which was followed by Benton leaving to be replaced by James Lillia of Clans of Death, and janitor Kevin Noodles Wasserman, also of the same band, was the second guitarist soon after, if mostly because he was the only one who was old enough to buy beer for the band. In 1986, the band changed their name to The Offspring after a movie with the same name, and when they and then they released their first single titled I'll Be Waiting. It was released on the self-made record company titled Black Label Records, and after a couple of demo tapes, both of which got positive feedback, James left to be replaced by Ron Welty. In 1988, the band released another demo tape, and they were soon signed to Little Nell Nelly from Nemesis Records, releasing their debut a year later. It had a limited release at the time, not even being made into a CD form until 1995. There was a six-week national tour after, but it had to be cancelled quickly after Noodles were stabbed during a Hollywood anti-nuclear benefit concert. Who stabs on a fucking benefit concert? Anyway, this album wasn't as successful as the band were hoping, and it is a weird one to decipher. It has a horror punk feel to it, and a lot of it is super fast even for a punk album. There are some songs that didn't even make it to certain versions of the album, and the cover had to be changed since the original one was seen as too gross to put on shelves. Also, several songs have rarely been played live, with the song Beheaded having only been played 24 times as of 2016, and the song Crossroads has never been played live. Like, ever. Despite the album's weird weirdness, though, I do actually sort of like it. It might be far, uh, fast. I almost said fast, but it's got a good structure and impact that carries the speed well, and the looks cover dark subjects like death, rape, politics, and love, the usual cocktail that you would cover. And but the band do carry it along well too. Dexter's vocals are quick and punchy, and he has some good wrist noodles. Guitar work is also rich and solid of its own. Greg's bass is deep and fast, and Rod's drumming is heavy, speedy, and sharp. Some of the songs include Beheaded, Jen Fell Off the War, I'll Be Waiting, The Great Closer in Hey Joe, and my favourite in Black Ball. The Offspring's debut is a peculiar beast, but it's fun, fast, and surprisingly dark, and yeah, I can recommend it. Even if other people couldn't. We then reached the band's second album, titled Ignition. Released in 1992, it would be the band's first three epitaph, and it was produced by Tom Wilson. Now, onto some background. Woo! After their debut album, the band teamed up with Tom Wilson in 1991 to release their Back Dad EP, which was instrumental in the band signing to arguably the biggest label in punk music. The label's founder, another bad religion guitarist, Brett Gurowitz, had heard the offspring stuff before, but he wasn't overly sold on them. Then he listened to Back Dad and signed them right quick after that. The band entered the studio, and in June 1992, they got the whole album recorded in one month. They did the same for their debut and the Back Dad EP, getting that done in February 1989 and March 1991, respectively. Ignition by name, ignition by nature, and ignition by recording process. Not only did the EP come out at the right time, but the album did too. Since alternative rock and grunge were all the rage at the time, it took a lot for a punk rock album to stand out among all that, and luckily this one takes all the right boxes. More on that later, though. As the album was successful and got the band much more recognition, they got some good touring opportunities. They hit up the US with Pennywise and the Lunar Chicks, and then got a European tour with their NoFX. So, if you think about it, The Offspring, one of today's best-known punk rock bands, got their start proper thanks to other big punk fans. All works out. I mean, if you think about it, they signed with the label which was created by a member of Bad Religion, and strong with no effects of Pennywise, two of the seminal bands in American punk rock, and Luna Chicks, a female in punk group, also being born to that style. It all just ties in well. It's nice to see that the offspring has given back to all of those and then some, because goodness, this help and kicks ass. It's got a fast pace to it again, much like their debut, but it strips away the hard punk of said debut, which I'm all for, personally. Another thing I like is that even though the band seemed to be proud of this one, in contrast to their debut. I don't know why I did that, though. Uh, 
Yeah, they seem to be more proud of this one than their debut, so woo. Uh, during a 20th anniversary tour in 2012, they played the full album at some of the concerts, and in 2017, they played the whole album in full for a benefit concert at 924 Gilman Street, where Noodles were thankfully only injured from knife violence, so yeah. But yeah, I'm a big fan of this album's pacing, and it has a great structure to it as well, with solid production holding it together. The lyrics cover breakups, addiction, and pain, to name a few, and the band shine through brightly. Dexter's vocals especially sound great and his unique style feels well present here with good riffs and plenty of time to show off and Ron's drum uh sorry I missed a bit there. Noodle Salos are uh, Andrews or nothing sneeze or either Greg's bass workers also miss with plenty of time to show off and Ron's drumming has good fills and timing. Standard songs include We Are One, Burn It Up, Kick Him When He's Down, Hypodermic, and my favourite in LAPD. Ignition fires fast and gives a brilliant pace and it's well written and produced to boots. So I can recommend this one. We then move on to their third album, Smash. Released in 1994, again through Epitaph and produced by Tom Wilson, this is the band's longest album of 46 minutes and 47 seconds. No background. Obviously, given the time of its release, bands like Green Day, Bad Religion, and Rancid were gaining traction, and Green Day's own album released at the same time, titled Dookie, became known as an album that revitalized punk rock. It's sort of the same case for Smash by The Offspring, but somehow, against all odds, Smash wasn't just a hit. It was a fucking slugfest. I know that's kind of a cliche line and a really bad one for me, but it's true. It's damn true. The band expected this album to not be very successful, and the fact that their working relationship with Tom Wilson was starting to go down the drain wasn't a good sign. I can't blame the band for thinking that at the time, I also can't blame for them for not thinking that this album would go six times platinum and set the record for most albums sold by an independent label with 16 million. I've said that uh, before that behind the scenes drama can really show up in a band, and after hearing this album for this episode, yeah, I know it, it fucking earned its place in my opinion. Hell, I think because of how well the album sold and how much money the band made, they made their own record label and bought the rights to the debut album. That label, Nitro Records, would soon sign future bands in all sorts of music, such as AFI, Gut and Mouth, and The Vandals, not small names at all there. Even more impressive considering the small budget that the band had to make this album. The band kept checking to see if the studio was empty so that they could get a discount to, uh, to record there, and the last few songs of the album were recorded in just two nights. The album, as I said, has earned all of that and then some. It has this duration to it by someone, although I don't know who, and it adds some dark comedy to an album that talks about three happy subjects. Come out of play, or in brackets keep them separated, was about the IA riots, as Dexter was about around that area as a grad student when the riots were actually happening. Self esteem is about a friend of Dexter who had a girlfriend who took advantage of him. Bad Habit talks about a person who has a fit of road rage to the point of shooting someone in the car in front of him, and Got to Get Away is about the pressure that the band felt to get the album finished. So yeah, the structure matches their subjects with fast pacing and enough chances to catch your breath, and the lyrics obviously go over street violence, bad relationships and struggles. And down to the band, band sell it well. Dexter's vocals are still punchy and, produ- and pronounced, as are his riffs. Noodles has great riffs in there too, great bass work is deep and nice timing on it, and Ron's drumming is nice and quick and heavy and has good drive. Standout songs include It'll Be A Long Time, Self Esteem, Genocide, Nitro, Youth Energy, and my favourite in Come Out and Play. Well realized, smartly written, and produced and performed greatly, smashes those accolades and then some. I can highly recommend it. We then reach the band's fourth album, Ixnay on the Ombre, which sort of translates to Fuck the Man, so that's maybe what I'm going to call it. Uh, released in 1997, this one came out in Europe through Epitaph and the rest of the world through Columbia, and was, it was produced by Dave Jordan this time around. We also have some guest spots, uh, as Jello Biafra of Dedicates provides the intro track and disclaimer, the band's friend Jason Blackball McLean appears on the song Motor, and Davey Havoc of Fayer provides Mac of Vocal Work too. Now, for the actual background. Now obviously, as I mentioned when talking about Smash, tensions rose with Tom Wilson and he would step away from working alongside the band after that album was released. Of course, since Smash was such a big album, since the offspring was the biggest band and epitaph label at the time, they couldn't exactly just up and leave them. That was until Brett Gurrow had stepped in. So, after Smash was released, the plan was for the offspring to stay on Epitaph, maybe release more stuff with them, or hopefully just be part of them for a long time. Then Brett happened. Oh god. Okay, so Brett made an effort to get the offspring signed to a major label. Normally that wouldn't be a bad thing, right? Well, you're wrong and you're stupid. He actually wanted to sell Smash to a major label to try and make tons of money from it, hoping for a royalty override. In the history of executive meddling dick moves, that one might have reached a new high. Or a new low. I can't tell. Obviously, the band didn't like this move, and Guru X kept trying to sign the offspring to several labels until the band decided to, to sign with Columbia of their own accord. And they didn't sign up with them for money, in fact, they took less pay on purpose for the signing just to spite Brett. They literally joined a major label for less money as a huge middle finger to the owner of their previous label that they once called home, trying to fuck them out of royalties for their most successful album. I think that might be the most punk rock thing I've ever seen in this series.
Respect. Honestly, respect. Anyway, that change did work for the band. Uh, they had more time to record this one as well as more money, and they didn't really take it easy at all. They experimented with their course hand, still maintaining their fast pacing and amazing grasp of tone, as has been present on previous works. The lyrics cover love, addiction, losing friends, and betrayal, to name a few subjects, and the album just sounds more relaxed. I like it when a band sounds like they're having fun, as is the case here. Dexter's vocals deliver well as do his riffs, new design riffs and solos are nifty and sharp, director bass is deep with good riffs and drive, and Rose rimming is quick, timed and pastoral. Standout songs include I Choose, Call to Hate, Me and My Old Lady, Amazed, and my favourite in Gone Away. Really surprisingly emotional song that, by the way. For an album that feels more relaxed, it's not lazy with great lyrics and good production to boot, and I can recommend it. I can recommend this one. Yeah. And finally, for part one of this episode, we reached the band's fifth album, Americana. Released in 1998 through Columbia and again produced by Dave Jordan, the album also denotes the shortest time between releases, and also this album not only contains my first offspring song in Brave Life for a white guy, but it was also my first full album by the band. This album is also the last to contain a trend in the band's records at the time, in that the last track had a hidden song, but each end song had a redone version of a riff from a prior song dating back to Smash, but they take way too long to go over, so I'm just going to move on to the background, so backgrounds! Uh, this album didn't take long to get out, not just because of the one year gap, it was recorded over a two month period and when that was done it was released two months after that. The album sound is one of their more punk rock efforts and it goes back to the sound of their second album as the band didn't want to change a whole lot about it like they did with x -Me. One thing I like is this album cover as it fits in well with the band's theme. Americana isn't a concept album by a long stretch, but it does have some narrative to it, with the cover being a prime example. To be fair, it reminds me a lot of the album Art for OK by As It Is, as both albums have a contrasting theme of appearing happy but having an underlying darkness, or, in Americana's face, murder. Uh, the difference is that OK is about the lead singer's issues with depression, and Americana is more like a social commentary on the stereotypical American lifestyle and how it's not all that it appears to be. To be honest, I feel bad for those who only know this album for Pretty Fly, because there's some surprisingly realistic depictions of American life here, and I say that as someone who's never been to America, but I watch a lot of American shows, and listen to a lot of bands who talk about it, so yeah. I think that's what makes it such a memorable album to me though, and not just because it was my first Offspring album, but I guess it's that when you've had over 10 years to work on your grasp of tone, you do perfect it at some point, and goodness, this album has tone for days. There's an almost unnervingly happy and upbeat punk energy to the core sound, but knowing what the songs are about and depict give it the darker side. It does add a sense of humour to it, making the social commentary feel very satirical, meshing th with the album's cover and theme. This might be the most conceptual, not actually concept album I've ever talked about, and it's still relevant even after 21 years. The structure and tone and pacing are all top-notch here, and it never feels misguided or too repetitive, and the lyrics cover overdosing, homelessness, broken families, drug addictions, and death and the band tied it all up really, really well. Dexter manages a great balance between comedy and seriousness for solid speedy riffs, Noodle's guitar work is packed with tasty licks and solos, Greg's bass is deep and driven, and Ron's work behind the kit is heavy and hard. Standout songs include the title track, Have You Ever, Why Don't You Get A Job, She's Got Issues, and my favourite in The Kids Aren't Alright. America Connor combines punk energy, satire, and great production for a super, super solid piece. I can recommend this one. Hell yeah, you. Anyway, that'll about do it for part one. Join me for part two, where I'll cover the next four albums. However, I'll probably see you all tonight because there's going to be another PBW stream. So, yeah. As always, thank you for watching. You're awesome. Bye-bye.